Hello, my name is Milt and I'm the lead pastor here at Birch Ridge Community Church. And I wanna personally welcome you as part of our online family. Listen, for whatever reason at all you've joined, welcome and know that you are loved beyond understanding by the one that we have gathered to worship today, Jesus Christ. I pray that your relationship with him is deepened through this time today. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, may today be the day that you receive him by faith into your heart and life. It's the most important decision that you will ever make. And if you are relatively new to the Birch Ridge online messages, and if you enjoy them, would you consider hitting that little subscribe or like button below this video? Thank you, you're awesome. And if you find value in our online messages and want to contribute financially to this ministry, simply go to our website at birchridge.org and click on the Give Online button at the top of that page. From there, you can give one time or even recurring. So, God bless you as you joyfully commit to what God is doing here. Many times, people want to know what the purpose of a church is. And at Bertridge, we want the whole world to know why we exist. And, and we'll repeat it often so that it stays with us all through the week. So, let's say it together. What's our purpose? Leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Very good. Again, welcome home and may God richly bless you today. Hello, friends. Consider this your not so subtle reminder to set your clocks forward one hour Saturday night. That's right. It's daylight saving time <laughs> or DST as it's known by people who like to use acronyms. Now, while you may not appreciate DST, you will have to comply if you live in North America and most of Europe. Oh, there are the exceptions of Saskatchewan, parts of British Columbia, and Arizona. Now, for those of you who hate DST, let me share some fun facts with you that just might change your mind. First of all, while many people pronounce it Daylight Savings Time, it's actually pronounced Daylight Saving Time. You see, by changing the clocks, we are saving time and theoretically using less energy. Second of all, while it wasn't implemented officially until 1916, the concept of daylight saving time goes all the way back to good old Benjamin Franklin in the 1700s. <laughs> Third, don't you blame the farmers. <laughs> no, my friend, our farmers are up before the sun no matter what this old clock says here. If you wanna blame someone, blame the golfers. It's estimated that every year daylight saving time brings in an extra $400 million into the golf industry. Or word with your clocks. <laughs> oh. That was uncalled for. So is daylight savings time. Stay strong, Arizona! So, but with all that being said, good morning! Good morning! Welcome to Birch Ridge Community Church. I am really, really glad that you're here today as we continue and finish a very short two-week series called Give it up. And before we uh, look at any scripture today, I want to ask you to help me recite our family declaration. The words will be on the screen if you want to help me. Everybody ready? Yeah. Yep. Just 12, right? Is everybody ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Therefore, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Very good. Good job. Um, can I be honest with you? Some of you are like, you better be honest with us every day, right? Uh, but can I share something with you? Uh, it's okay. 
Yeah. Okay, good. Just check. Uh, last week was kind of a, a tough message for me to deliver. Might have been a tough message for some of y'all to hear. I've had several people come up to me and say, you know what? Spot on, word for word, right on. Right? I have, and I had some that said, I'm not sure, uh, but, but what I want to say today in preparation for this message is, is looking back last week, is two things I don't want you to get lost in. Two things I want you to remember. Number one, it has never been, nor will it ever be, about money. What I said last week, the message last week, and the message is it never about money. If you think it was, you just got lost. It's always been about the heart. Everything is always about the heart. So don't lose that first bit of info there. It's not about money. It's always about our heart. And number two, if you were listening closely, you heard me say over and over, if you do. You remember that? If you do. We're talking about being generous and, and, and obeying scripture. And we talk about returning the tithe and stuff like that. And I said, if you do, and because I really wanted to hone in on this thing, is that I want God's best for you. I want you to experience every bit of blessing. Like, I don't want any of y'all to miss out on any of it. Like, I want God to just spill it all over you. I want you to, I want him to just gush it on you, blessing after blessing to where you're like, oh God, can you hold on for a minute, right? I want you to feel and taste and experience blessing after blessing. And I got to be honest with you and tell you what God's word says, but at the end of the day, y'all got to make a choice. You get to make the choice, right? As a matter of fact, scripture, when we talk about that today, it says you shouldn't even listen, you shouldn't be pressured by what the preacher says. You should do what your heart says, right? And if God has your heart, well, we, we don't even need to keep going. We can just stop right here. But I'll make sure that I'm having your heart. That's the important thing, okay? Has everybody, has everybody got that? So as you, listen carefully, as you seek to please God with your time, with your talent, and with your treasure, do your own due diligence. Do your own due diligence to make sure you are operating, that you are living your life in the sweet spot of God's heart. <laughs> Can you do that? Forget about, you know, forget about, you know, agree or not agree exactly what is said differently or whatever. Do your own diligence to make sure that you are living life in the sweet spot of God's heart. Will you do that, church? Will you do that? Okay, good. Uh, do you realize that God tests us? I didn't say tempt. God never tempts us, but I firmly believe that God tests us. He is testing us every day to see if we will be faithful with small things so that he can entrust us with large things. He wants to test us to see if we're faithful with earthly things so that he can entrust us with eternal things. He is tested. Luke chapter 16 and verse 11. Let's look at scripture. It says, And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? Listen, I contend that money is a small thing. Right? Money is a small thing. Please say amen if you agree with this statement. Money's all going to burn up one day. Amen. It isn't going to last. On the last day, it's not even going to make honorable mention. Right? It doesn't mean a hill of beans on the last day. Money means absolutely money means so little. But then again, hold on. But but you're like, preacher, but I need money to pay my rent, pay my mortgage, put gas in the tank, put food on the table. Yes, you are right. So on one hand, money is really important because we need it to live, right? Let's just be honest. We need money. But at the same time, money isn't going to make honorable mention on the last day. So what do we do with it? So I contend that money is very small. Money's a tool, y'all. Money is a tool. You see my hand? It's a tool. Some people look at the whole body of Milt and say, Milt's a tool. But that's a whole other sermon. Oh my okay? <laughs> my hand is a tool. I can use it to put my hand on you and, and comfort you in, in your time of sadness or grief and, and let you know that I love you and that God loves you, right? My hand can be a, a beautiful tool. Or I could just smack it upside the head. 
and it could be an ugly tool. Is it, you see, it's neither good nor bad, it's just a tool. Money can be used for good, money can be used for bad. Money is just a tool. The problem, y'all, is that money is more than a tool to some people. Money to some people is a God. And God will not have it. God will not tolerate sharing loyalty with anyone or anything, including money. He's not going to have it. So, God is testing us. He's not testing us in hopes that we will fail. He's testing us in hopes that we will succeed so that he can move on and trust us with bigger things, that trust us with eternal things. And that's what he wants. He wants us to pass the test. He wants us to be successful so that he can put us in charge of much. Watch this. Okay, maybe we need to go over this one more time. Do we have to? Well, sweetie, I don't know if you're getting a good grasp of the ratios here. Fine. Okay, all right, well, step by step. Before we spend any money, what's the first thing that we do? Give to God. Good, and why do we do that? Because he first loved and gave to us. Good, 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 good. Okay, great. Now the second jar here is for so many different things. Hold on. What? God lives in heaven, right? Yeah, he lives in heaven. And heaven has streets paved with gold, right? Streets paved with gold, sure, yes. So why does he need my money if I don't even have a job? <laughs> okay, all right, so good question. So basically when we give to God, we're, we're giving to the church. So the church gives the money to God? No, the church keeps the money. Oh, does God know about this? <laughs> yes, he uh, basically built the system, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. See, sweetie, as you grow up, there is nothing better than giving back to God. In the Bible, it's the only place God says, test me on this. When it comes to your money, he says, test me. It's almost like he's saying, I dare you. And your mom and I, we do just that. Even when things are tough... We always give the first part of our money back to God. And then the church takes that money and does all kinds of things to make God famous, uh, like camps and mission trips and even VBS that you love so much, and even helps out people that are in need. You can't outgive God. And when God says test him and you do it, he will come through every single time. Okay, Dad, I get it. I do have one question, though. Uh, okay. Why do we need to test God if he already knows all the answers? That's, that's good. Let me just retrace my steps here just for a minute. <sighs> something together today. Everything that is, is God's, yes? Everything that he has given us, including the breath in our lungs, is God's, yes? He's given us everything, and he's just asking to, for us to return a very small portion, yes? So, so when I think about these truths, I conclude that God is testing us with something small so that he can know whether he can trust us with something large. I mean, that's how I see it. Listen, I want you to experience God in all his fullness. I want each and every one of you to fall madly and deeply in love with Jesus, our Savior. That is what I want for each and every one of you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. 
No one can serve two masters, <coughs> for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Help me out here. It says, for the love of money. One more time. Say it together. For the love of money. One more time. The love of money. You see, hold on back. Remember, money is not good. It's not bad. It's a tool. It's neutral. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. It's not money. It's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money, living for what this world has to offer, living for more, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Yet, yet, how do we know if we're living for and loving money? It's a good question. I contend the answer is this. When you are expecting money to fix your problems, you are living for and loving money. You see, money makes all kinds of promises. Money can never fix your problems. Only God can fix your problems. Amen? Money promises what only God can deliver. Money promises all kinds of things, and yet God is the only one that can truly deliver the goods. Money promises security. If I just had a little more money, then I would be secure in this crazy world we're living in. If I just had a little bit more money, then I would be secure in my retirement fund. If I had just a little bit more money, I'd just really feel good about a whole lot of things, right? Money promises significance. You know, if I just had a little bit more money, I might be somebody. If I had a little bit more money, people would look at me differently. If I had just a little bit more money, then I'd be able to show that I am capable of this or that. And listen, you are significant not by what we read in your checkbook. You are already significant based on who God says you are. God says you are blessed coming in and blessed going out. He says you are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. He says you are more than conquerors. God says he has plans to bless you and prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. Your significance is not in this world or the things this world provides. Your significance is in Christ and him alone. Money promises freedom. If I just had more money, then I'd be free to stop doing that. And I'd be free to start doing that. I'd be free to go here. I'd be free to go there. But no, 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 it doesn't work that way. Because if you had just a little bit more money, then you're like, ooh, but then if I had just a little bit more money, and then if I had, and then, and then also you're a slave chasing that money all over the place. You see, freedom can only be found in Christ. You can't find freedom in money. It, you, you may think, well, I'm free to do something, but then you, it'll make you a slave in a different area. Every single time, true freedom can only be found in Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You shall know the truth, Jesus, and the truth, Jesus, shall set you free. And he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. You see, the only freedom we can experience is in Christ, not in money, not in things that this world offers and taunts us with. Money promises all kinds of things that only God can actually deliver the goods. Here, here's the bottom line. There is a war waging within me. There's a war waging inside each one of y'all as well. You see, there's this, this battle between my flesh and my spirit. My flesh is selfish and wants to please milk. My spirit is extremely generous and wants to please God. My, my flesh is driven by my sinful nature, while my spirit is driven by my love of God. You see, listen, listen carefully. Love gives. Love gives freely. Now, if you don't know Maddie and I very well, let me tell you a couple things about us. She's a country girl. I'm a town boy. Not town boy, town. Like, I, mean, I was that spoiled brat, like on Sandlot. Like, I would go to school, I'd come home, do a couple chores, do my homework, off to the baseball diamond, and I'd play baseball till it was time to come home. Right? That was it. 
Maddie loves animals. I love to eat them. Okay? <laughs> and yet, over the years of us being married, she has had horses, donkeys, goats, chickens, peacocks, guineas, dogs, cats, even a turkey named Bob that would eat sunflower seeds off my tongue. <laughs> Now why would I allow that? Because I'm afraid she'll beat me up? Well, yes. <laughs> but, but also, why would I do that? Love. Love gives freely. Love prefers. I prefer not, but she prefers to, so I put my own wants, needs, and desires aside to do what she wants. Love gives, do you see my point? Love gives, it gives freely. John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world. He loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Love gives freely. Listen, is a free gift to you and I, but it costs. Jesus, everything. What caused God, what would cause God to give his one and only son for us? One word, love. Love does that. So when you try to wrap your brain around the, the reality that uh, you heard on the video, you never, you know, we can't outgive God. Like, well, you and I will always be the bigger debtor. Right? You can try, you can try, you can try. You're never going to outdo God. You're never going to pay Him back. You're never going to break even with God. We will always be the bigger debtor. So when we realize the ex how much God loves us, and we're going to get, we're going to get wrapped around the spokes about a message about money, you're going to get twisted and upset over, over, over the preacher talking about money? Listen, listen, y'all. If you get upset about that, then I really encourage you to go back and do your own due diligence to make sure that you are functioning your life in the sweet spot of God's heart. Because when you do that, you realize you can't outgive God. He has given a gift that is beyond anything we could ever repay or ever comprehend. So let's just look at two ways in which love goes. Love gives. Okay? Number one, love gives cheerfully. Love gives cheerfully. Say cheerfully. Cheerfully. Now say it with a smile. Cheerfully. cheerfully. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Uh, something like, yeah, you're uh, Anyway, it's true. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And it's, look, look what it says here. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. You see, remember what I said earlier? At the end of the day, it's all about you, your choice. You get to choose. But I encourage you to make sure you're operating in the sweet spot of God's heart. You get to choose, but please stay in His will. Don't go off crazy in the, in the wilderness and get off track. I want you to have every one of God's blessings. I want Him to bless you and your family and your life and your career so much. Make sure you're staying in that sweet spot. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. In other words, don't get, don't get all froggy and be like, oh, fine, take it. Because you know what I think God says? Like when I read that, what I think God would say is I keep it. Just keep it, keep it. I don't need it. Listen, God created it all. He'll make more. He doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. Do you see that? So don't give reluctantly, like, fine, I'd rather do this, but I guess I'll do that. He says, keep it. Or don't give a response to pressure. You know, Pastor Mill said, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't, do your due diligence. And when you see that the scripture lines up with what the preacher says, then fine. But you decide from your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or pressure. Because what's it say? For God loves a person who gives what? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. One more time. God loves a person who gives? Cheerfully. That's right. Do you see this is really about a heart issue? 
It's not about money. It never has been. It never will be. It's always about heart. So not only that, and listen, not only does love give cheerfully, but look what it says. It says the giver will be blessed. We're going to look at some scriptures really cool. The giver will be blessed. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and you will receive. Now see, here's, here's where people get, get lost in this, this whole uh, gospel uh, idea that God is a giant Coke machine, right? That if I put a dollar in, I'm going to get a Coke, right? God says, if I give, I'll give. Well, it just says right there, give and you will receive. We'll cut, we'll come back to that in a minute. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shake it together to make room for more, run it over and pour it into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. See, preacher, there it is right there. If I give a dollar, I get a dollar. And this is what God says. First of all, we last week we talked about you give, he's going to open up the floodgates of heaven and pour you out blessings so many ways, but he'll take it all in. That's more than uh, uh, even trade, right? And I, I, let me tell you, I've never been that person that, that has that miracle story of like, you know what, I, I gave my last 15 bucks and then I went to the mailbox on Tuesday and there it was. Like, right? I, I, I've not been receiving one of those miracle checks in the mail or whatever, but, but listen carefully. My wife and I have driven cars with well over 200,000 miles. Well over. And we drive across the state without a worry in the world. Right? In all of our years, we bought one major purchase, we bought a washer and dryer. We've never purchased an appliance. Everything just lasts. You see, that's blessing. That's blessing. God says, if you're faithful, I'm going to pour you out a blessing so big. And sometimes, it's not money. Sometimes it's just like, stuff lasts. Like, don't we read that in the scripture? You know, the jar just never gets empty, right? Clothes that never wear out. Y'all, God is so much bigger than we give him credit for. Trust him. Let him be God. Something interesting about that, about that scripture, that's actually a picture of an Old Testament, not story, an Old Testament uh, uh, practice. In the, in, in the Old Testament, there was these rich farmers that would, uh, at harvest time, they would hire general laborers to come in, and the, and the rich farmer would, would basically hand each one of them a, a wheelbarrow. And said, I'm hiring you to go out into my field and, and bring the harvest into my granary. So he said, take the wheelbarrow, go out there, and you fill it up, and you bring it back, and you pour it in the granary. You go out there, you fill it up, you bring it back, put it in the granary. At the end of the day, you get to bring that wheelbarrow full, and you get to keep what's in the wheelbarrow. Y'all are just like me. I know you're going to do the same thing, right? We fill up the wheelbarrow, but we don't fill it super heavy, you know, because we've got to do this all day long. So we fill it up, and we haul it to the granary, we dump it out, we walk back, we fill it up, we take it to the granary, we dump it out. But when the last wheelbarrow of the day, oh my God, you better believe we fill that bad boy up, right? We stack that thing up, we press it down. We put some more on it. We shake it so it settles in. We pour some more on there. We stomp on it. We just, and then we just pile the new pile it on there. And it's just gushing over the sides. And we're being really careful to push it home because we get to take all that with us. Right? That's what God promises to the faithful giver. That he will, he will give to us. Uh, a full amount, pressed down, shaken together, running over into our laps. This is kind of the same thing as what we read last week, right? We'll open up the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing so big you won't be able to take it all in. That's how God blesses the faithful giver. So love gives cheerfully. Number two, love gives extravagantly. Love gives extravagantly. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in verse 1. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also, what's it say? Filled with abundant joy. Say that with me. Filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in what? Rich generosity. 
For I can testify that they not only that, that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it what? Of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Watch this. Great value cookies are good and fine, but sometimes they just don't cut it. Sometimes you have to be extravagant and get the Keeblers. You know what I'm talking about? Like this story in the Bible, there was this sinful woman and Jesus had forgiven her. Yet she was so overwhelmed by the thought that Jesus had completely and totally forgiven her that she wanted to do something special for him. She wanted to show her love and appreciation to Jesus. So she had this bottle of perfume and she took this bottle and opened it up and she poured the entire bottle out onto the feet of Jesus. It was believed that this bottle was so valuable that it was worth an entire year's wages. Can you even imagine that? Pouring this bottle of rare, expensive perfume onto someone's feet, knowing that it was worth an entire year's wages? Y'all, that's extravagant. And then there was this other time when Jesus was standing outside the temple and people were lining up to give. Now, if you read this story carefully, you'll find something very interesting. The Bible says that Jesus watched what the people gave. Did you catch that? Jesus watched what the people gave. And what's interesting to me is that the Pharisees actually gave a lot of money. But Jesus instead talked of a poor widow. A widow who gave like two pennies. And Jesus said that she gave more than all the others because this poor widow gave all that she had. Did you catch that? She gave all that she had. You see, love gives extravagantly. So let me ask you this. How do you give? Let's say you came to see me and you wanted a root beer. What would I give you? Well, if I really, really liked you, you'd get the mug. But if I really wasn't sure about you, you'd probably get great value. Was that just a camera I saw in my refrigerator? Mmm, look at those cookies. Again, if you came to see me, what would you get? Well, if I really, really liked you, you'd get these fudge grams from Keebler. And, well, if I really wasn't too sure about you, you might get these great value fudge cookie things. And then there's this story in the Old Testament of the Bible, in this book called Malachi, where God gets all over the priests. You see, he asks the priests to bring in animals, their very best animals as sacrifices, animals that were perfect without a spot or blemish. But you see, the priests weren't loving like they should have been, and they didn't offer their very best. Instead, they brought in animals that were blind or crippled, ones that weren't of much value at all any longer. And God was like, why? Why would you offer me something less than your very, very best? Like, why would you do that? Because love always gives its best. Love always gives its best. Love gives cheerfully and love gives extravagantly. And you know that I love you. And so I've got the best stuff here for you. So come and have a seat and join me. Remember, the preacher loves you. It's going to be all right. For God so loved the world that he gave. We will always be the bigger debtor. We'll never be able to outgive God. We will never be able to repay God. 
Aren't you glad that God gave his very best? Love gives cheerfully, love gives extravagantly. As I think about scripture, Jesus is described as this. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despised the shame, was willing to put up with the torture, the ridicule, the, the teasing, the beating, because he knew it was on the other side. He knew that his death, burial, and resurrection would result in an opportunity for you and I to confess our sin, to receive Jesus as Savior, and that we would get to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven forever and ever. That's the joy that was set before him. Don't leave without it. 